Good morning, I'm Herb Purrier. Welcome to the Logos Center. We have a special address to share with you today. I'm calling it a spiritual understanding of present world conditions. You know, the truth will set us free and it's hard to share the truth. Um, Jesus accused Jerusalem of killing its prophets. And in the Old Testament, the people said to the prophets, prophesy to us smooth things. And so we want to be optimistic. And being optimistic doesn't mean that we have to be naive about the truth. The idea is that we face the truth of what's happening with a sense of optimism. And the basis of that optimism must be our faith in God and knowing that God is behind it. And we've shared with you the idea of someone holding the planet and saying, where does it hurt? And it hurts everywhere. And yet we also sing this glorious song, he's got the whole world in his hands. And so what we begin to meet, what we encounter, uh, some people call the wrath of God. And God is not wrathful. God is love. But... God is also lawful, and the things that we meet of our own making, we, we reap what we sow, and the things that we reap of our own making may be of such pain and magnitude that we say it's the wrath of God. But God is working with us. There's a pressure of God's love that works with us, even in, the, in spite of man's evil. Now, I have... Um, a lot of ideas I want to share with you, and, um, and I'll share them uh, not in a continuity of a development of a thesis, but to give you some things to think about. First, I want to remind you of this book, Archetype of the Apocalypse. I've um, read this book June in 2004, uh, again in June in 2004, July of six. 8th eight, uh, of um, aught 7, and then on the 6th on, in June of 2020. And I've shared this with you because of its tremendous importance. The name of it is Archetype of the Apocalypse. And it's by a Jungian, and he's based this on three major books by Jung. Jung was a Swiss psychologist that had an estimated IQ of 200. He was also a son of a minister and he was a very spiritual man. So he, he has brought forth some profound wisdom. Now in this archetype of the apocalypse, I want to just share with you um, some of these ideas. You know, the, the three witnesses that I want to share with you, the Bible, the Casey World Affairs readings, and... Um, and the Casey interpretation of the Revelation. And then with this from Jung. So what these Jungians are maintaining, and Jung, was, Jung died in, in um, um, 60, 1962, and, and um, this book was written in 1999. So they were seeing what was happening already now, an archetype is a pattern. It's a pattern within the individual, and the Casey interpretation of the Revelation is, can be said to be archetypal. It's a pattern within us, but it's a pattern because of the cumulative consciousness of humankind that can exist and, and um, act, as these Jungians say, almost autonomously. Here's, for example, uh, Jung, uh, Edinger, the author of this archetypal book. What we are about to discuss is a primordial psychic pattern of the collective unconscious that is at the same time a dynamic agency with intentionality. When it constellates, and this is a big thing for them, this constellation of the archetype, what's happening now is a constellation. And uh, I've listed 12 things that we're facing at this time. Um, school children being killed by rifles, um, whales 
being destroyed by pollution in the ocean, the climate change, the racial differences, the wars. So there are a dozen of these major things that we are facing. Now when the archetype constellates, it generates itself and manifests itself in the individual psyche and in the collective psyche of the group that it happens to touch. Put differently, archetypes live themselves out in whatever psychic stuff they can appropriate. They are like devouring mouths, finding little egos they can consume and then living out those little egos. And he says, we have evidence all around us in our daily analytic practice in, a, in the contemporary world that this earth-shaking archetypal event is taking place right here and right now. It has already started. It is manifesting itself in international relations, in the breakdown of social structures of Western civilization, in political, ethnic, and religious groupings, as well as within the psyches of individuals. One can perceive the archetype, the apocalyptic archetype, in all these arenas. Once one is familiarity, once one is familiar with its contents and has eyes to see. So, continuing with this resource, finally at the end of the spectrum, you know, there are cults like the David Koresh and Jim Jones and others. The unions maintain that there's a spiritual quality here. We see it as evil or, or ego or something, but the, there's a center within us. Let me tell you about this. There have been studies with rats who have implant electrodes in their brains at the pleasure center. And rats will push a lever to get food, but if they can push a lever to get that brain simulated, they will push it until they die, starving themselves to death. So this pleasure center within us is, I, get, I think God made it for it to stimulate the highest spiritual reaction we have. But when it's stimulated out of accord, that can be infatuation or stalking or um, um, this um, following evil cults or misled cults. And so there is within us the potential to be Christ-like, but when that pattern is stimulated out of accord, it becomes destructive and addictive. And so there's, when we see people following a pattern that doesn't seem to make any sense or even seems to be wrong, it's not out of meanness necessarily, it's out of a spiritual conviction. For example, in this January 6th raid on the Capitol, a woman stood there innocently saying, I thought I was doing what my president told me to do. And she was puzzled. We're puzzled by this pressure that we have and uh, to, to follow, and it's a religious impulse gone awry. Now, I want you to understand that um, this is not politics, and, and um, you see the word politics is used to divide. If you say, like Al Gore said um, in this um, book on um, inconvenient truth, people said, it's just politics. And, and you use the word politics to divide. And I want to share with you from the World Affairs readings the intent of capital to divide the people. Basically, he says, as long as capital can keep the labor people divided, they have nothing to fear. So are we divided? The stock market is higher than it's ever been. And there one out of four or five children are going hungry. So the, the divide is, is uh, not political. What Casey is going to say is it's about what the division of wealth. And, and I'm going to read some specific quotes from the Casey readings on that. But getting back to this idea of the archetype, in addition to the collective manifestations of the apocalyptic archetype, 
we have individual manifestations. These have these, he, he defines the several qualities that people have when they're possessed by the archetype. Let me be psychologically correct. And he's talking about John. And he says, in John's revelation, he was so pure. And, and what the unions maintain is the center of our beingness is the self. We call it the soul. And above that, there's the ego, and above that, the persona. Now, below that, in the unconscious, is the shadow and the anima or the animus. Now, the more we emphasize the persona, just the high ego, the more those dark forces come out. And that's what the Revelation says about the four lower beasts and how they must bow down before the crown. The Jungian says, Jung, this is Jung himself, when the summit of life is reached, when the bud unfolds, and from the lesser, the greater energies, as Nietzsche says, one becomes two. And the greater figure, which one always was, but which remains invisible, appears to the lesser personality with the force of a revelation. He who is truly and hopelessly little will always drag the revelation of the greater down to the level of the littleness and will never understand that the day of judgment for his littleness has dawned. But the man who is inwardly great will know that the long expected friend of his soul, the immortal one, has now really come. Now, to assure you that I'm not talking politically. I want to share with you two sermons that I gave. 1947, I'm a junior, I mean a, a freshman in, in Baylor, and I gave one sermon on the street corner of street preaching in Waco, and my text was from John 3:19. This is the condemnation that men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And the other sermon that I preached, I'd gone out one Sunday night to a little church in Leveland, about 12 miles from Lubbock. And the, the young minister out there just insisted, I couldn't get out of it. He just insisted that I do the sermon that night. Well, I had been reading Matthew 24 and 25. And many of the apocalyptic uh, treatises that we talk about, like the Revelation, fail to mention that this 24th chapter of John. Now, these are the words of Jesus, and it's called the Olivet Discourse. When he sat down, the disciples came and said privately, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? I grew up with cartoons, you know, men with beards carrying signs, Jesus is coming. Well, they were right, and we laughed at it, but they were right. When is this coming? When will the end of the world? Now, this is not going to be the end of the world. There have been many apocalyptic occasions, big ones like the destruction of Lemuria in Atlantis, and then others like in the fourth century. So they're apocalyptic things. We had it in the world wars. Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come and saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Some may say, I'm the chosen one. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. You see, we have to meet what we've sown. And we have sown, you know, karma is like this. If I build my house close to a river and it floods, I may say that's the wrath of God. But what I may find that if the river rises, I'm going to get my house destroyed. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And these are the beginnings of sorrows. Now remember, he says, don't fear anything is coming. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted 
shall kill you and you'll be hated for all nations sake and then shall many be offended and betray one another and hate one another and many false prophecies shall rise and deceive many and because of iniquity shall abound the love of many shall grow cold we see this in our friends just wearing masks and and our love you know i make a point every time i see someone say good morning hello they don't answer back but we don't want our love for our brothers and sisters to grow cold and because of iniquity love of many shall wax cold but he that endureth to the end the same shall be saved we want to endure to the end in our faith in our faith and and prayer and he says there will come a time when the gospel will be preached all over the world when therefore you see the abomination of desolation spoken by daniel the prophet stand in the holy place in parentheses whoso readeth let him understand when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by daniel the prophet stand in the holy place then let him which is flee into the mountains uh, now this is not literal i think jesus always spoke in parables but i'd always thought that the holy place was the mount of um, in in jerusalem the holy mount but one of the guards at the capital said this is a holy place and so when we see people trying to destroy this holy place and the daniel prophet it's in daniel 7 it's almost as though he's defining uh, he says it's almost like a, a bulldozer after this i saw night visions and behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly and it had great iron teeth it devoured and break in places and stamped the residue with the feet of it and it was diverse from all of the other beasts that was before it so th- the the abomination of desolation of which jesus spoke when you see this you know the end is at near then let him in judea flee the mountains let him which is on the house top not come down neither let him take that which is in the field return back to his clothes and woe to them that were with child and to them that give suck in those days but pray ye that your flight be not in winter in the sabbath for then shall be the great tribulation as as was not since the foundation of the world nor ever shall be again so this is matthew 24 now the continuing the alvelet of his hot discourse in 25 he gives three parables that are the answer to this how we are to deal with this now in um, in the revelation there's the city of babylon which is the lower self and it's the lower self of the nation as well as the individual and babylon is destroyed and the the um the merchants say how they can't sell their goods anymore so our present merchants now they need their money but they're bemoaning the fact that this great city babylon has fallen but it has to fall that lower self has to fall so that the new jerusalem and what we want to understand is that what this change is about is that these dozen or so uh, challenges that the earth faces like racial disparity and and wars and and earth changes that these um are products of what we've sown and they are of such magnitude now that there must be a dramatic change for us to move ahead so i like the word travail the bible uses the word travail and it's like oh, these these ta- what travail means is labor and and the pain um, women say there's hardly a greater pain than being in labor in travail the whole planet now is in travail for the purpose of giving birth to the new age and we're promised this new age but the consciousness haven't happened now we've gotten excited about the coming of the new age 
and we know about and, and the KC prophecy from the Bible says there will be a thousand years of peace. He tells people, be ye determined to be in that number. So we want to endure to the end, even in the face of the destruction of many things that we love. So the, the, um, the sermon that I preached on this Olivet Discourse, Jesus' prophecy of the apocalypse, and then his answer to it, these, these three parables, the parable of the ten uh, virgins, the five and five, the parable of the uh, talents, five talents to one, three to another, one to another, and the one just didn't use it, and he was the one condemned. And the message is, Work with what we've got. If we've got five talents, make it into ten. If we've got three, make it into six. And if you have one, if you don't feel like you're strong enough, you feel they're not worthy for God to hear your prayers, if you have one talent, make it into two. And then the other parable, the sheep and the goats. And it's amazing that many charismatic Christians are supporting a... a um, political philosophy that's so destructive. And so they're saying, uh, this is the way. Now this parable, sheep and goats, says, at the end he will divide the people into sheep and goats. The goats will say, didn't we heal in your name? And he will say, I never knew you. There's, there'll be Christians that believe and they say, didn't we heal in your name? And he will say, I never knew you. And they say, why not? because the way you treat the least of these, and I interpret that to mean those of whom we think the least, the way we treat the least of these is the way we treat the, the master. It's the way we treat God. Now, the sheep comes forward and say, when did we heal in your name? When did we aid in your name? And he says, inasmuch as you help the least of these, you help me. So it's not the belief. It's the, it's the help, it's the caring. Imagine these nurses and doctors that are going through, you know, we're just, Ann and I, experiencing a couple of weeks of real challenge. And it's nothing compared to the nurses and doctors that are dealing with this plague. And this plague that comes from God is not his wrath. It's that the, the Cumulative things that we've done of all sorts of these dozen things, we're destroying the planet and killing our school children. This, these are seed that we've planted. Believe me, if you plant corn in the spring, in the August when you harvest, you're going to get corn. And if we plant hatred now and political division, and I want to talk with you especially about how Casey addresses what's happening. It's not politics. It's about the wealth. He says, you cannot have one measuring stick for the laborer in the field and the man behind the counter and another for the man behind the money changers. All are equal, not only under the material law, but under spiritual. And his laws, his will, will not come to mat, mat, uh, will not come to naught. Though there may come those periods when there will be great stress, as brother rises against brother, as group or sect or race rise against race, yet the leveling must come. And only those who've set their ideal in him and practice it in their dealings with their fellow men may expect to survive the wrath of the Lord. Another, if those in position, now these World Affairs reading, of which there are 29, were given, the last one was given in 1944. So he sees this coming. Like the Jungians say, the archetype is constellating, and he sees this coming. And so it's in the Bible, it's in the Jungian, it's in this Casey readings. Every phase of human experience and human relationship must be taken into consideration. Just as indicated that given, we are our brother's keeper. Then, 
if those in a position to give of their means, of their wealth, of their education, that's what I'm trying to share with you. We have to give. If they do not give, do not take these things into consideration. There must be that leveling that will come. For unless these are considered, there must be eventually a revolution in this country. There's going to be a revolution in this country. And there will be dividing of the sections, one against another. For these are the leveling means and manners to which men resort when there is plenty in some and lack of the sustenance of life in others. These are the manners in which such things as crime, riots of every nature, disturbances arise, in that those who are in authority are not considering every level, every phase of human activity and human experience. We have just had a battle before the Senate. And again, we've got to get away from political. What, what um, Casey is saying is there's evil because of greed. This is the word, greed. And here's an example. Julia Roberts made $25 million on a single movie. During the Eisenhower administration, the income tax was 90% and the interstate highway system was built. Now consider if she made 25 million and got only a tenth of that, two and a half million, then she, and an uh, everyday worker, if, if an everyday worker made $15 an hour, 30 years, you know how much the total he would make? 900,000, less than a million. In other words, uh, a wage that we can't even reach, $15 an hour, gives you 900,000 in a 30 year period. And these people like football players that make 25 million a year, they're making two and a half times. So this is, it's not saying that everybody ought to be, uh, have an equal amount, but if, to leave children hungry when the stock market is breaking records, this is the problem. Now, we continue um, because this is, all, this is the theme all the way through the Casey readings. You are to have turmoils. You are to have strifes between labor and capital. You are to have a division in your own land before there is the second of the presidents that will not live through office. A mob rule. We are to have a mob rule. Unless there is a more universal oneness of purpose on the part of all of us, this will one day bring here in America a revolution. And continuing, when the many isles of the sea, many of the lands have come under the subjugation of those who fear not man or devil, but rather would associate with that in which they claim, proclaim might and power as being right, as that in the Superman, then shall thine own land see blood flow as in those periods when brother fought against brother, like the Civil War. You only live moment by moment. This is the World Affairs readings. You only live moment by moment. Then make that moment, each moment, as one in which you will give glory to God, just being kind and patient and loving to your fellow man. Thus you will indeed find that you will entertain him who has promised to be your brother, your helper. For as he gave, put your burdens on me, learn of me. Now, I've invited you to put your faith to work and become people of prayer. The readings say, and the Bible supports it, that the, our prayers can do more good than anything else. And if we pray and seek to be of help to others, then the way will be shown and we will be more clearly shown how we be of help to others. So renew your faith. Prepare to face some of the difficulties. Put political divisions. You know what Casey said? As long as labor, as long as capital can keep labor divided, they have nothing to fear. Capital is trying to keep labor divided. And if we call it political and seeing what it is, capital and labor and the greed of capital, not sharing the goods, and, and the, we've been assured by the Master, and we're assured in the Bible, and we're assured in the Casey readings, that our prayers are heard, that every prayer is heard. 
because we are children of the Most High and God loves us and we are, we are brothers and sisters. Be, you know, you are God's children of the Most High. And so we, we uh, some people say, oh, I'm not worthy. Yes, um, what we see the worthiness is, is um, Jesus talked to the Pharisees and he said, I didn't come to save those that are saved, I came to save the lost. We may be the lost ones. I think the Logos group is kind of a black sheep group that we haven't found peace in uh, various religions and we came here and we're still, you know, like all ye, like sheep have gone astray, there's no good among us. Um, Mark Twain said, people are no damn good. And Scott Peck said, beginning off, life is difficult. Life is difficult. Once you understand that, you'll not feel put upon. So don't, as these hardships come, don't feel put upon. Just know that we're children of God. We're meeting what we have sown cumulatively and individually. We're all, and we've all gone astray, but it's God's love. It is, he is moving us to uh, make a change and so to have the promise of the new age that's coming. He said, imagine a time when there's no desire for evil. Become prayers, join us in prayer, and stay with your faith and your Bible, whatever, whatever lifts your spirits, and be faithful. Those that endure to the end in their faith will be saved. God bless you. God bless America. God bless the Logos people. And God bless each of us as individuals. Be people of prayer and faith. Thank you. You shall cross the barren desert, but you shall not die. Of thirst, you shall wander far in safety, though you do not know the way. You shall speak your words to foreign men, and they shall understand. You you shall see the face of God and live. Be not afraid, I go before you, always come, follow me, and I will give you if you pass through raging waters, in the sea you shall not drown. If you walk amid the burning flames, you shall not be harmed. If you stand before the power of hell, death is at your side. Know that I am with you through it all. Follow me.